So we're in chapter three this morning of Ezra. And I want to begin by, uh, I think today I'd like to just read a few verses here. And let me see, chapter three, verse one, we'll go down through verse seven. Now, when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it, was, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. They celebrated the Feast of Booths, as it is written, and offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily, according to the ordinance, as each day required. And afterward, there was a continual burnt offering also for the new moons and for all the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated, and from everyone uh, and from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa, according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So, they are back in Jerusalem, back in Judea. Uh, uh, they, those who have returned from, uh, from I was going to say from Babylon, from Persia, from what has become the Persian Empire. Uh, and uh, they had permission, even encouragement from Cyrus, the, the king of Persia, to do this, and so they're back. Some of them are at least. What's the first thing they do when they get back? They worship, sure, they, they, they worship God. But what specifically did Cyrus say that they were going back to do? He said, you can go back and you can rebuild the temple to your God. And so they go back and they, and the first thing they do, has, have, they, have they built the temple yet? As of this narrative we've just read? Haven't, haven't, haven't even started. Have they built the, found, have they built the foundation of the temple? haven't even started doing doing the temple yet. What do they build first? They build an altar. This was like a, a central aspect of their worship. Goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, the offering of sacrifices to God. It was a central part of their worship, build an altar offer sacrifices to God. Uh, we might, do you wonder, do you ever wonder why all the sacrifices, all of the animals slaughtered and killed? I know, I have known people that, that struggled with this thought there was something about it that was unkind to the animals or something. What, what, let me ask you this. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it in a leading way. Thinking as Christians, living in the 21st century now, but looking back to Jesus, what do you see in Jesus? You see a sacrifice, right? 
I'm not sure I can say this entirely where, the, where all of the sacrifices, all, everyone, like pointing to Jesus. Uh, per, perhaps so, but certainly that is, that is one aspect of those sacrifices that I think is undeniable. You might recall from the book of Revelation, if you've read, um, I haven't read Revelation in a while, but I remember in the book of Revelation, there is the lamb that was standing as if slain, which is a little bit of an odd kind of a juxtaposition of ideas. The lamb is, a, seems to be alive, stand, but, but as if slain. Does, does that sound like Jesus? Who was slain, but lives? The lamb of God, he's described sometimes. I think we see, we can see this now. I don't know how much of this they, they would have understood before the time of Jesus, but we can see now in those sacrifices, we can see a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. And so, so the, it, whether they understood this or not, they did understand that the worship of Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, necessitated the offering of the sacrifices. And that was central to their, to their worship. That was like, what did they do at the temple? Maybe they were different when, the temp, when they had the temple and at the tabernacle. What did they do there? And the main activity at, in the temple seems to be the offering of sacrifices. It would be in a priest would be almost in some ways, almost like working in a slaughterhouse. It was a bloody business, but that blood foreshadowed the blood of the blood of the lamb, the lamb of God, the blood of Jesus that shed for us. Anyway, they build, uh, they build a, uh, an altar and they offer sacrifices. When was this in the calendar? Seventh, seventh month. And uh, so when the seventh month came, do you know why particularly the seventh month might have been a significant time? I think there was a, some significance in, in this is happening at the seventh month. But you, you might go back to the book of Numbers and this is Numbers chapter 29. Tells us of some of the, the, the feasts, we call them sometimes, the festivals that uh, were part of the law of Moses that they were to observe uh, on a regular basis. And uh, these are also, these feasts are also described in the book of Leviticus, but here in the book of Numbers in chapter 29, it gives us uh, kind of an encapsulated view of, of the feasts and festivals and celebrations. I'm not sure celebration is quite the word, the remembrances that were to take place specifically in the seventh month. And there were a bunch of them actually in the seventh month. That, and there were certain sacrifices to re, that were required along with them. In Numbers chapter 29, verse the first verse of that chapter, and I'm reading today from the New American Standard Version, uh, says, Now in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall also have a holy convocation. You shall do, no, what's a convocation? What does that word mean? An assembly, right, an assembly, coming together. Uh, you're to have, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no, labor, no laborious work. It will be to you a day for blowing trumpets. I thought about bringing my trumpet today. I have a ram's horn trumpet that I just, I just kind of wanted one. They show up in the Bible from time to time, many times, so I bought one. 
And you can buy one too if you want one off the internet, of course, where you can find anything. I didn't bring my lamb's horn trumpet today. Don't, don't imagine a, a brass three valved instrument like Miles Davis would play, for example. A trumpet here is a generally what they used in their worship was made of the horn of a ram uh, and uh, prepared so that you could blow in one end of it, you know, with the buzzing your lips like a trump, like a modern day trumpet player would play a trumpet. And they are they are quite loud, uh, and they were used for used in combat, and they were uh, as a signaling device to signal to give signals and directions to soldiers in the field. And they were used uh, like a watchman standing on standing watch on the on the tower on the wall of a city to watch for enemies. Uh, they would have a trumpet would be a signaling device. It's it's more a signaling device than it is among them than it is a musical instrument. Uh, so anyway, on the first day of the seventh month, they were to have this convocation and it was a day for blowing trumpets. And so guess what this is called sometimes? This is the Feast of Trumpets. Not maybe one of the more prominent of the feasts that we've heard of as much, but it is here. And it was in the seventh month and it was specifically on the first day of the seventh month. Uh, then down to verse seven of Numbers chapter 29. Then on the 10th day of this seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, another one, and you shall humble yourselves. You shall not do any work. You shall present a burnt offering to the Lord as a soothing aroma, one bull, one ram, seven male lambs, one year old, having them without defect, and so on and so forth. Do you know what, uh, what occasion this was on the 10th day of the seventh month? This is the day of atonement. In, in modern day Israel and in, in modern day Hebrew, this is called Yom Kippur. You've heard of Yom Kippur? Some, some of you, maybe not many of you, some of you are old enough to remember the, what's known in modern Israeli history as the Yom Kippur War, which took place. The enemies of modern day Israel attacked them on the Day of Atonement. So this, this is the Day of Atonement, the 10th day of the seventh month. And uh, what comes five days after that? Let me see. Verse 12, Numbers chapter 29. On the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work, and you shall observe a feast to the Lord for seven days. Does anybody know what this one is, what we often call this one? By the way, this is the one that, that the book of Ezra mentions by name, specifically. The Feast of Booths, uh, or also known as, seems like when I was a kid, uh, I heard it called the Feast of Tabernacles. We weren't using the New American Standard Version back then. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. What's a tabernacle? A tabernacle is it's like a portable building. We might think of it sort of as a tent. It might be, the, you know, the tabernacle uh, of the Israelites that they built and used as they were wandering the wilderness. It wasn't just like a, some kind of a canvas structure with poles. It had more, there were, there were uh, wooden uh, panels that they used and it was covered over top with animal skins and there were fabrics involved and so on. So I'm not sure the word, what I think of as a tent is something you can fold up and carry in a pack on your back maybe. It, a tabernacle was not necessarily a tent as we might think of tent, but, but it is a portable temporary structure. And uh, some translations uh, in Ezra chapter three, and through actually throughout the Old Testament or throughout wherever it's referred to by name, might call it the Feast of 
tabernacles, some of the other, uh, earlier translations and maybe some of the more recent translation call it the Feast of Foods. Yes. Yeah, whether it's all of that, even with all these activities being done, all the sacrifices being done, all the sacrifices of the atonement, mm -hmm. uh, their heart had to be right. Mm -hmm. And God, of course, knows the heart. And when they brought those sacrifices, it had to be in sincerity and true devotion to the Lord. True devotion. With all of that, their heart had to be right. True, yes. But why were they there is a there is a reason given here. I don't know that it would be the only reason. They are returning to reestablish the worship of the Lord. That's, I suppose, the first primary reason. But there is another reason given here. Let me see. They were afraid to see the kingdom of God. Exactly. Uh, what verse is that? Peace of children, burnt offerings. Verse three. I'm back, I'm back in Ezra now, chapter three, verse three. So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands, which we'll talk a bit more about the peoples of the land shortly, especially as we get into chapter four. But they were they were terrified of the people of the lands. One thing they apparently have finally gotten the message, at least for now, they've gotten the message that God can and will defend and protect His people. And they're go and they're looking to God. Apparently, in their fear of the people around them. They're looking to God for protection. Okay, so they 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 have they're making some real progress in returning to the Lord here. Instead of saying, "Well, we're going to ally ourselves with the Egyptians, or we're going to we're going to go buy horses from them and chariots and so on," and and that's the way we're going to protect ourselves. Then they are appealing to God. The reason, one, the reason that's given here for the sacrifice, building the altar and doing the sacrifices is because they are terrified of the people around them. And so they're appealing to the Lord for their protection. By the way, there's a lesson for us there as well. God can and will take care of his people. And it won't necessarily be in quite the way we, we imagine we would want be in the way that he knows to be best. And we live in a time, I don't know how you feel about the times we live in. I think people of every age probably have said, oh, it's worse now than it's ever been. Uh, seems like I heard some of that when I was a kid. But I'm certainly, certainly here now, and I've lived through some times where I've seen what seems to me to be our, our culture, the heart, the hearts of the people seems to fall further and further and further away from the Lord. Even to the point where, where we see, and over the last two or three years at least, especially we see people sometimes being arrested for having church services. I'm talking about in, during, during the COVID shutdowns. Did you think you would ever see a time when People in our country. I'm thinking of a particular case that was in Canada that I read about in the in the news. But did you ever think that here in our enlightened Western world we would see people being arrested for going to church? So I don't know where things are headed in our time. I think I think the same thing probably that my grandparents thought back during World War II. It's like things have never been as bad as they are now, and they're just getting worse. Uh, I don't know, but uh, in our day, when we see things getting getting bad, what's the solution? 
one thing that I see in our day, maybe it's always been like this too, but I see a lot of people that profess to be, to be Christians, people who profess faith in the Lord, uh, self-identified as such, seem to be putting their faith more in political candidates and changes in civil secular government that comes through electing this candidate or that candidate or some other candidate. That's, that's the way thing, we're gonna turn things around in our country. We're, gonna, we're going to elect this person as president or we're going, to, we're going to get the legislature of our state in the hands of this party that we think is more friendly to, to, uh, to us some way, somehow. And, and that's not where the solution is found. Never has been. Let's learn what they learned. And let's learn that, that our problems are addressed by being people of faith in God. God can and will take care of his people. And uh, I don't know what might happen in the future. I would like to think that we will have at least many more, many more years, decades, centuries of the freedom to worship without fear of being arrested, imprisoned, fined, beaten, killed. I hope we don't we don't have that uh, ahead of us in the near future. But I, it, there's a sense in which it doesn't really matter if we walk by faith in God. We will be on the winning side of whatever conflict we may have in front of us, and. And we will enter the Father's Sabbath rest in the resurrection, right? Yeah, I think what I hear what you said because you know, see, it's not just in the political community. Any kind of celebrity, any kind of powerful person, when someone is, is well known and they sort of kind of see the same right things, but I, I see so many people in the sort of gravitating that person is kind of on a major leader and supposed mm -hmm. to be the same person. And I would say, okay, this person is right on this issue, but this person is not really going to be a leader for Christians or even for conservatives because it's just, you know, I understand why you are happy that this person is mm -hmm. on the right side of things. It's like a strong side of kind of powerful leader. Even if a leader makes some of the big disciples, but we should already have it. We already have a leader. Exactly. And I think sometimes it doesn't seem real to us that we look for another leader that is real and he is real and he can identify with him, he is all of us. Yeah, make us a God. Give us a king. So anyway, let's notice some of the some of the language that is used here. Thinking about the the Jews returning and a renewal of their seriousness of their serving the true and living God. First of all, notice in, ver in verse one of Ezra chapter three, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Notice their unity here in their, uh, in their endeavors. Uh, let me see. I'm looking for some particular uh, statements here. Verse two, uh, let me see. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel and his brothers arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to, to offer burnt offerings on it. Notice what comes next. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. You notice that we they are doing what was written in the law. It says, uh, there were like three different similar statements here. They were different. Verse four, they celebrated the Feast of Booths as it is written, he says, as it is written uh, in the law of Moses. Again, as it is written, fix the number of burnt offerings daily according to the ordinance, each day 
according to the ordinance as each day required. And if you go back to that passage in Numbers chapter 29 and read particularly in, in Numbers 29, it's just the, the festival, the feast on the 15th day of the month, but it's the feast of booze that he's talking about here that, that's referred to here. And notice the feast of booze, had, there were seven days of the Feast of Booze, and there were certain sacrifices specified for each of those seven days. And so, so uh, there was a, a fixed number of burnt offering in verse four, they celebrated the Feast of Booze as it is written and offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily according to the ordinance, there it is, according to the ordinance as each day required. So you see, they are serious about looking to God, looking to his law, looking to what God requires in their service to him. And then there's some description here of some of the, some of the kinds of sacrifices that they were offering. In verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month, they begin to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. The first, the first day would be that Feast of Trumpets. Uh, they begin to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. They hadn't started building the temple yet. And so they're, they're starting with turning their hearts to God and worshiping him as he required, as it was written. Eddie? Yeah, I yeah, I hadn't thought about that. The, Ezra was a scribe, and what did the scribes do? Well, they wrote things, but particularly the scribes among the the ancient Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites and the Jews, the scribes wrote the law. They didn't have mechanized printing, hadn't been invented yet. And if you wanted a new copy, somebody had to sit down with pen and I started to say paper. It wasn't paper, it was like parchment is what they would have used and write it laboriously by hand, and scribes did this. And so who would, who would be most inti intimately familiar with the text then? Word by word, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, they are writing it. The scribes would have been very familiar with the text. As it is written, Ezra says, that's what they did. And there are other yeah yeah and and again because because they didn't have mechanized printing to us i you if you want to if you want to pray today and thank God for something in your life, thank God that you, this is one thing you might thank him for, is that you live in an age where you have ready access to his written word. Bibles are cheap. I'm talking about the cost of printing and acquiring one. In fact, you can find plenty of people that will give you one free of charge. And even if you're buying one, I've seen them, I've seen them on the internet for about a dollar each, a complete copy of the scripture that you can buy if you want to buy one. Or you can buy a bunch of them and give them to people. And we live in an age in which literacy is here in our country, at least, is almost universal. You can read and you can write and you can get a copy of God's word. And so there's something to be grateful for. Think about, think about the people in this day who didn't have their own copy. They were enormously expensive 
it took 30 or something on the order of 30 to 40 sheep. I read this one time somewhere. It took about 30 to 40 sheep to produce enough parchment sheepskin for one copy of the old Hebrew scriptures. And then it had to be properly prepared and then somebody had to laboriously write it letter for letter, word for word, line for line. And so they were, they were very expensive. They were, people didn't have them. And even if you had one, you couldn't read it anyway. So anyway, I am grateful that I live in an age where I've got a Bible and I can read it. Yeah, I, I wonder what the scribes were doing through that about 70 years of the Babylonians. Yeah, it was during this time, it was during this time that they come to think of it, that the concept of the synagogue arose. If you look back in the law of Moses, this, the concept of the synagogue wasn't, a, wasn't there. It was not a part of the, the law of Moses. And so the, the synagogue idea arose during the captivity because the Jews, that's, they couldn't go to the temple. There was no temple. It had been destroyed. They couldn't go to even Jerusalem even. They were, they were held there in this distant place. But the, what they could do is they could get together in small groups and they could study the scripture if they could get a copy if they could have one they could read it and they could still do this and so they and one thing you could do in the synagogue is the synagogue could have a copy and the synagogue has a copy then there could be somebody there in the synagogue who could read it and so when they could meet and they could somebody could read from the script, and you see them doing that in the New Testament. You see Jesus going to the synagogue, and you see Jesus being handed the copy of the scripture and invited to read from it, which he did, and then commented on it. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, where are we? Let's 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 go back to the text here. Uh, so they they haven't started building the temple yet, but verse seven, they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So they haven't started building the temple yet, but they're start but they're doing some preliminaries for building the temple. They are, they have taken back with them. They took money. You remember the money? We read that in one of the earlier chapters, 60,000 drachmas and gold drachmas and so much. And they, this was going back with them. And then they're donating and using that to gather materials and to, to pay the craftsmen. To the, was the temple built by slave labor? They've got masons and carpenters, and they're paying them. Okay, they weren't, this was not slave labor that was building the temples. Food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians. Sidon, those would be the people of, of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, so, so what, what, why are they giving oil and food and stuff to them. What's that about? They're, yeah, the Tyre and Sidon, Jeff, was the 84 lumber of, the, of their day, sort of. That was the, have you heard the expression, the cedars of Lebanon? This is where the cedar, this was Lebanon, where the cedars of Lebanon grew, so to speak. Uh, they were native, the cedar trees were native there. They grew well and they grew big. And the people of Tyre and Sidon were experts in the, in, I guess, the, the 
the felling of the trees and the preparing them, preparing of the lumber and so on. Solomon had used them when the first temple was built. And so they're going back here to the same source for the wooden materials, at least. And the giving them of food and oil is they're just paying for the, they're paying for the lumber, basically, and the labor it's taken to produce it. And what they'll do is they will put it, this is not described here, but they would, they would take that lumber and, and build rafts out of it, so to speak, and uh, sail it down the, the eastern uh, edge of the Mediterranean and down to Joppa, which would have been a Jewish city, an Israelite city, well, as an Israelite city originally down to Joppa, and then they'd haul it on to land, and, and that's the way they would, they would transport it uh, by, by water. And so he, he refers to bringing, bringing the wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa. That's just their best transportation uh, technology to get it there. Okay, so they begin then the, the temple restoration in verse eight. Now in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak. Jeshua apparently was the high priest, remember, uh, and the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work and appointed the Levites from 20 years and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah and the sons of Hinnadad, uh, with their sons and the brothers, uh, brothers the Levites to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites the sons of Asaph with symbols, those were part of the, remember the, in chapter two, the different groups of people, the different categories that are identified and how many from this and how many from that group. And so the sons of Asaph were one of those. Uh, the, sons, the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord according, according to the directions. Remember that uh, according to what was written, and uh, earlier in the chapter, now, according to the directions of King David of Israel, they sang, praising, and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is... This, this statement in verse 11 caught my attention. They sang, saying, for he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. What does that sound like? God is good all the time when we, when we say that god is good all the time that's exactly what they were saying they they were saying it in probably in aramaic so what are they celebrating here verse 10 what are they doing at this point Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple, they've got, they've laid the foundation, they've got the foundations done. Let's pause and let's praise God and let's thank God and let's celebrate this because we can now, now there's something there that we can see that this is going to be the temple and we are, we are beginning here with the temple. We do things like that in our day when we have in a major construction project. We may have a groundbreaking ceremony. We may have uh, uh, a topping out ceremony. You, you know, have you heard of topping out ceremonies, especially if you're building a really tall building and, and you finally get the peak the highest point of the building is done. Now the insides, it's not, not at all finished yet, but the basic superstructure is done and you've got it all the way up to the very top now and we'll have the topping out ceremony. We'll pause and maybe have some kind of a celebration. Some, if it's a major building in a town, maybe some dignitaries will come and, 
to a, do a speech and it'll be on the news and all of that. So they are pausing at this point to celebrate the progress they have made and the progress is we've got the foundation done now. And it is, it is quite festive, right? You see what they're doing? They've got singers, the sons of Asaph, by the way, were the musicians. And uh, some of the Psalms, if you look in the, in the book of Psalms, you'll see at the beginning of the Psalm, some of them will say a Psalm of David, and some will say this is a Psalm of Asaph. So uh, anyway, they are singing, they're playing in, they're playing their instruments, the cymbals, playing the cymbals and singing and praising God and giving thanks for he is good. God is good all the time for he is good for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And, and that was a wonderful thing. And, and, and we can pause and see that that is a wonderful thing, that it's a wonderful thing that they see this as a wonderful thing to be celebrated. And because God's people are returning to God and they are excited about worshiping and serving him. Okay. Verse 12. Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Have you ever been somewhere in the vicinity of, I started to call it Commonwealth Stadium, whatever it is we call it now, Kroger Field? Have you ever been in that vicinity? I still call it Commonwealth Stadium, sorry. I remember when it was new, and that was... I'm kind of like these old guys that remember the first temple. Uh, I remember when it was new and it was Commonwealth Stadium. Have you ever been in that neighborhood on the day of a football game? And you don't even have to be all that close. And our team scores a, scores a touchdown and the shout goes up. And you can hear it a good distance away. I have observed that myself. Maybe you have too. You can hear it when, how, how many voices are there? There 60 or 70,000, something like that when it's full. And you can hear that a long way off. This is, I don't know how many people there were here that were singing and shouting and some of them weeping, but it, it was, a, they were raising quite a ruckus and it made a great noise and it could be heard a, a good distance away. They weren't celebrating a touchdown. They were celebrating the, construction of the temple and the worship of God. Okay. Why were they, why were some of, why were the old men weeping? This is, by the way, this is addressed in, uh, we've referred to the book of Haggai. This is addressed in the book of Haggai. The the in the book the book of Haggai chapter two verse three Haggai says who is left among by the way we're we're coming up to the time where reading the book of Haggai is particularly helpful and it falls into the narrative. And so you might want to between now and next Sunday maybe read the book of Haggai. It's about a page and a half long as it's printed in my Bible. It will not take you long to read it. But in verse three, he says, he said, Haggai says here, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? 
Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Comparing the temple that they were building here to the first temple, apparently it didn't live up to the glory of the first temple. And the old men that are weeping here, it doesn't say so here, but the conjecture is here is the old men are weeping because at this point in the narrative, all they've got is the foundation. But perhaps they're already thinking, this is not, you know, we remember what it was like before, and this is not nearly as glorious as the original temple built by Solomon. So there was great rejoicing here, as well there should have been, but there was also some sadness on the part, particularly of the older people who knew what it had been like in the old days. Okay, so this takes us up then to the end of chapter three. How much time do we have? A couple of minutes, not much. Uh, so we will stop here. And in chapter four, we're going to encounter the opposition. Remember chapter three said that they were fearful of the people around them. And so in chapter four, we're going to read about the opposition that they uh, had to face from the people around them. Uh, you might want to take a look if you're doing your own study between now and next Sunday. You might want to take a look at just who were these people. And, and it's interesting to see some of the things that they said about they. They, one thing they said is say they, they came to the Jews that were starting to rebuild their temple and said, hey, we'd like to help. We'd, we'd like to join you in this. So read about that and understanding what's going on there uh, with, with their desire to help or their, their statement of a desire to help and with the Jews' rejection of that help. See who these people were, and we'll talk about that some uh, next Sunday. See you then.